Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, several issues we wanted to make sure we mentioned today. Um, we, we saw over the weekend, uh, yet again, one more time, this time the third ranking House Democrat uh, say that uh, he believes essentially that it is inevitable that the Democrats uh, will impeach the president. And, uh, you know, we, we are watching this unfold. I know that there are a lot of discussions, fights, arguments, debates going on on the Democratic side. Uh, of the aisle. Uh, they uh, have got a very strong and seems to be growing uh, segment of their caucus uh, who believes that they should move forward regardless of the facts, regardless of the situation. They've believed since uh, uh, many of them since the election that they ought to move forward to impeach the president, and they are absolutely determined to do that. Uh, we think that's a shame. It's bad for the nation, bad for the Constitution. Um, fundamentally, I think, is an irresponsible action with respect to what our duties and responsibilities are as members of this body. Um, to continue down this path of these uh, investigations, which really are based on um, partisan attacks and on the fact that they uh, do not believe Donald Trump should be president. Uh, we have too much hugely important work to do, uh, work that the American people elected us to do, things that we ought to be getting done. Uh, things that make us, uh, put us in a position where we're able to ensure that we're going to continue to create jobs, that we're going to continue to see the kind of economy that we've seen under this president and his policies. We ought to be taking real action to lower prescription drug prices, not the kind of partisan package Speaker Pelosi put on the floor uh, 10 days ago or so. So we are going to continue to make sure that the American people know that we're here working on their behalf, uh, despite the fact that we've got uh, a real partisan effort uh, at impeachment in an unconstitutional fashion going on on the Democratic side of the House. Um, and today, we also, in particular, I know our leader is going to speak about uh, Normandy and, and our whip, uh, as well as China. And we, we wanted today, um, especially this day, which is the 30th anniversary uh, of the, the killings at Tiananmen Square, uh, to have Congressman Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin come uh, and, and address uh, issues connected to China for us. So with that, I'll turn things over to uh, Mr. Gallagher. Sure. Thank you. Well, it's my second stakeout. I'm honored to be back. Um, I think Liz invited me back because she wanted me to give a boring lecture on Cold War history, so I figured I'd oblige her. Um, but in 1946, in his famous long telegram, Wisconsin's George Kennan argued that the Soviet Union was committed fanatically to the belief that in order to preserve their own power, they had to break the authority of America. And dealing with this threat, Kennan, in Kennan's view, would be the greatest task our diplomacy had ever faced. Today, I would argue we face a similar strategic challenge, and 30 years after the atrocities in Tiananmen, the Chinese Communist Party has only grown more repressive at home and aggressive abroad in their attempts to break our international authority. And I would argue the free world faces a threat Thing we have seen since Kennan's time. And what we are seeing today in Xinjiang province, for example, where General Secretary Xi Jinping has over a million Uyghur Muslims confined in concentration camps, where they face beatings and torture with no legal recourse, what we're seeing there is not just an abomination, but a preview of things to come. The Chinese Communist Party is using Xinjiang to perfect its totalitarian surveillance state to succeed where their Soviet predecessors failed. And beyond shining a light on the atrocities of Tiananmen, beyond shining a light on the atrocities in Xinjiang, beyond imposing harsh sanctions on the individuals responsible, and beyond cutting off the flow of U.S. technology that enables these repressive systems, I think our most difficult task is simply to stay true to our own values, because the American vision of equality, liberty, and rule of law, in my opinion, provides a self-evident contrast to the dystopian future offered by the Chinese Communist Party. If we instead abandon those values, and try to out-China China, going further down the road of government control, socialism, tech-enabled utopianism, we will lose. As Kennan put it in 46, the greatest danger that can befall us in coping with the problems of communism is that we should allow ourselves to become like those with whom we are coping. Finally, let me just say, I don't believe we have a China problem. I believe we have a Chinese Communist Party problem. And I actually think in many ways, at least on the Armed Services Committee, which I'm proud to be a member of, this is an area of bipartisan agreement which is why we should all be alarmed when leading Democratic presidential candidates suggest otherwise, that the Chinese Communist Party does not present a threat to our interests and those of our allies. And today, 30 years after the massacre in Tiananmen, this should remind us that that type of thinking is naive, it is dangerous, 
and today should remind us that we need to stand strong and send the Chinese Communist Party where it belongs, on the ash heap of history. Well, Mike, thank you for your passion and just laying out exactly what the problem is and in, in how the Chinese government uh, is so repressive and, in fact, uh, won't even let their own citizens know about this history of Tiananmen Square. And so it's important that we, uh, we remind the world that this happened 30 years ago, that there are still people in China today that want to speak out and are not allowed to or stomped down by their own government. And so as President Trump continues to put pressure on China, uh, we stand with him in letting people know that this, this goes on, needs to stop, uh, China needs to respect the, uh, the views and the freedom of their own individual citizens. We also remember this week the 75-year anniversary of the Normandy invasion. Uh, D-Day was such a turning point uh, for America and our allies in the fight against Nazis and to, to defeat the Germans and ultimately to win World War II in that pivotal moment uh, where we lost so many people, but we won uh, such an important battle in, uh, in the Battle of World War II. I'm honored to uh, be an early supporter and to be able to go and see the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. It's, uh, it's, it's one of the, the places where we're able to capture the history of World War II and to tell the story of the greatest generation. Uh, for so long, our heroes from World War II wouldn't share their stories even with their own children because they just felt it was, it was a duty uh, that, they, uh, that they carried out, but when they came home, they just carried on a normal life and didn't feel what they did was extraordinary, and yet the world knows, we sure in America know, how extraordinary the efforts were and the heroism was of the greatest generation. And I'm proud to be able to help celebrate that when we share the World War II Museum with, uh, with millions of people from all around the world. And uh, there was a, a proud moment last week uh, where the American Spirit Award is given out every year by the World War II Museum to people who exemplify uh, that, uh, that history. And last week, Dick Cheney was one of the recipients. And so I know Liz was there proudly with, with her father and with her children to be able to, again, pass that kind of history on to the next generation. That's what the World War II Museum's all about. So uh, I'm glad Liz got to be able to be there and be part of what, uh, what was, I'm sure, a special moment, having Dick Cheney receive the American Spirit Award. Um, this week, we don't have a lot of legislation on the floor, as has been the custom of Nancy Pelosi's speakership. They don't have much of an agenda. They're focused on impeaching the president. Uh, but this week, the only real bill they're bringing to the floor is focused on giving amnesty to millions of people who are here illegally, but specifically to people that have actual criminal backgrounds. And one of the many disturbing parts of the amnesty bill that is going to be voted on today Speaker Pelosi has language in the bill that blocks law enforcement from accessing the gang database. So today, so many prosecutors across the country were able to use that gang database to identify people uh, that are part of or associated with gang activity. And yet in the bill, they block law enforcement from even being able to access that gang database. So it's a bad bill. It's a bill that shouldn't pass. Uh, but we'll see if they're able to get the votes, and hopefully this would never get to the president's desk because it's not the way to solve our, our problems with immigration. We've got a crisis at the border. This bill adds $34 billion of unpaid for spending to give amnesty to people, and yet there's not a single dime in this bill for border security. And it just goes to highlight that there is a crisis at the border, and Democrats in Congress refuse to solve this problem. In fact, in the next two weeks, possibly, HHS could run out of money uh, that has been allocated to them to address the health problems that are related to the thousands of people that are coming across our border illegally every single day. President Trump sent, weeks ago, sent a request for over $4 billion to address this crisis at the border, and Speaker Pelosi refuses to take action. And if she doesn't take action in the next few weeks and HHS runs out of money, which right now they're scheduled to do. Think about what's going on right now. So thousands of people are coming over every single day illegally. Department of Homeland Security receives them and stops them and detains them. 
by law, they've got to detain, let's say, young children. And if young, some of those young children have health problems, they turn them over to HHS to help take care of those kids. Well, if they run out of money in the next two weeks and there's no money for HHS to take care of the health needs to these kids, they're still going to be held by DHS, Department of Homeland Security, and there will be no way to make sure we can take care of the health needs of those kids. That's why President Trump called on Congress to take action. Speaker Pelosi refuses to address this crisis. It is about to reach ahead in the next few weeks. We shouldn't let it get there. Congress needs to act. I'm calling, we're calling on Speaker Pelosi to take action on the president's request for this crisis at the border and take action now. Now we'll turn it over to our, our Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Whip. And I, I want to thank um, Mr. Gallagher for his, his comments today. 30 years ago, the world watched. If you try to read about it in China today, you will find that you will be blocked. 30 years ago, Tiananmen Square. Why did they gather at Tiananmen Square? Why did a million people arrive? Because Tiananmen stands for Gate of Heavenly Peace, a symbolic place where individual rose to crave freedom. It shows that America is more than a country, that America is an idea of self-government. The idea that you have freedom of speech and others, and it's contagious. In Tiananmen Square 30 years ago, we watched a million people stand together for reforms within their own country. It was so powerful that they built the goddess of democracy, looking much like our Statue of Liberty, facing directly across the portrait of Mao. Anyone 40 years or older knows the moment of what they watched. A lone man standing in front of the tanks that the Chinese government was about to roll in to the gate of heavenly peace. A lone man standing above for the idea of freedom. We do not know where he stands. We do not know how many hundreds or thousands of people were murdered that day because the government will not say. What we do know is they have less freedom in China today than they did 30 years ago. That the idea of control moves throughout that country. That in China today, the only nation in the world that gives a social score to all their citizens. If you want to buy a domestic airline flight, when you go to the ticket office, they ring up your score. If your score is not high enough, you do not allowed to buy that ticket. If you want to move up to a business class on a train, if your score is not high enough, you cannot buy that ticket. There is a story of one reporter who could not buy a ticket and they told him your score was too low by something you had written on Twitter. They asked that you apologize. He apologized. But the government said it seemed insincere. It wasn't a good enough apology. This is a government that promised the world when they built an island in the South China Sea that they would not weaponize them. Well, that is not true. This is a government that in their scoring determines whether you're buying Chinese products. Not just America. The world should watch of what is happening in China today. We should begin a national discussion about what transpired 30 years ago and where the world is going for the future. And I thank uh, HASC for their work in this area and for the rest of uh, the committees as well. Last week was a big week. Last week of many things happened. Some things that um, broke records. A record that I don't know that we will be proud of, but it was the largest one-time encounter of people crossing the border. More than a thousand people in El Paso, in one encounter, in one location, at one moment, came across the border. We are breaking all records. There will be, the statistics say, more than a million people stopped illegally crossing the border. Those are only the ones who are caught. There is a crisis at this border. There are people from other countries than South America who are now utilizing, coming from other continents that are now crossing this border in large numbers. Part is fundamentally Congress's problem. We should fix the loopholes. It would not be difficult. 
You would think Judiciary Committee, I looked to see if they had any hearings. I see no hearings about the board. Even though the New York Times editorial page writes about it, everybody in America realizes there is a crisis except the majority party here in Congress. They refuse to take any action. We will spend as much as an entire year in one month to house individuals that have illegally crossed this border, but they refuse to supply the resources needed to make sure we're secure, or they refuse to pass legislation that deals with the subject. The other things that happened this week were items that I think begin to show, again, the long-term plan of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, long before they took the majority, have a plan and a goal and a reason why they ran was to impeach this president. You heard it from individual freshmen on the night of their swearing in when they were sitting with their supporters of why they ran and what their goal was to impeach the president in words I will not repeat today. You watch Chairman Nadler, who became chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and we all know how you become chair of committees as you campaign with your own conference, and you get your conference to vote, and what did he campaign on? That he would be the best chairman for impeachment. That was his campaign to win the chairmanship. Then we watch the number three on Sunday show this week and say, yes, we will impeach the president. And we watched the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, on late night TV in much say the exact same thing. This has been their goal. This has been their plan. They do not care about facts. You had 66 Democrats vote for impeachment in the last Congress before the Mueller report even came out. Even though the facts lie, there is no reason for impeachment. They only care about politics. If you watch on the floor, even when we have bipartisan bills, they want to make sure that does not become law, and they want to put a poison pill in it. That is what we're seeing from this new Socialist Democrat Party. It's not the party we knew in the past. It's not a party that I think is focusing on what the American people desire and what they're hearing on the campaign trail. Because if you go on the campaign trail to those who are running for president throughout those early states, nobody brings it up. Nobody brings up the Mueller report or impeachment. They do bring up prescription drugs. And you know what? We had a bill to come out of committee where all Republicans and all Democrats voted to lower the prescription drug price and give people more options, three bills. But the leadership changed it before it came to the floor. It's all about politics for them, putting politics before people. Our week this week is shortened, and it's shortened for a reason, and a good reason. We will commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. I will be traveling with the speaker and a number of members over to the shores of Normandy to remember the June 6, 1944, where more than 70,000 men risked their lives. They did not do this for recognition. They did not do it for glory. They wanted to prove to the world that tyranny will be fought in any place around. They really, truly are the greatest generation. I will hope for one moment, as we spend the time thinking of those individuals, more than 4,000 Americans who lost their life that day, more than 50 miles of beach broken up into five segments, the ones, two you remember the most, Utah and Omaha, planned for more than a year, a turning of the tide of one of the most devastating wars in the history of the world, of where would the world be today if that generation did not stand up, if they would not be willing to risk what they did that day, we should continue to honor them and make sure they did not fight in vain. And I think one of the areas that we can is here in this house, to focus and put the commitment on the things that they wished we could in their essence. Focus on what the American people desire, the idea of freedom and liberty, and stand for that in any place around the world. Just as those in Tiananmen Square 30 years ago would stand before that tank to risk his own life for the idea of freedom, the idea that had built this nation and continues when American leads the world to safety. Question. Yes, ma'am. President Trump said in London today that its lively tariffs will go in effect on Mexico next week. And I wondered if 
you think this is a good idea, and would Republicans vote to block these tariffs? I didn't see what the President said. We were in conference, but the one thing I do know is speaking with the President, we have a meeting tomorrow. And um, Secretary of State Pompeo will be there. I noticed the conversations with the um, leaders in Mexico as well have been very productive. I'm very hopeful. That's why there are no tariffs right now. We have to June 10th. I think the best outcome of this is to have Mexico assist us in the manner of what's happening on this southern border. And Mexico is not moving. America is not moving. They have, we have good relationships there. I think if they are able to help us along this border, there will be no tariffs. And that's why this meeting tomorrow will be so important to take that step. And I believe that's the step we want to see happen. Yes. I believe at the end of the day, we'll get to a solution that solves all problems. Uh, Leader McCarthy, last week, the special counsel came out and reiterated what he said in his report, which was that the president repeatedly tried to obstruct his investigation. What did you think of that? Well, I read the Mueller report. I've gone down, unlike Chairman Nadler or Speaker Pelosi or the Democrats, when you can go down and read the last six lines of the second version, they have not. I have. Um, I think it's very difficult of how you can obstruct something that never happened. If you have no collusion, how can you have obstruction? Because you, you can't obstruct something that didn't take place. I think well, the only thing the president was doing was standing up for something that went on for 22 months of made up of a dossier. I think we really should find why this all started and where it's going. You said in the report you do not need to have an underlying crime for a charge of obstruction. So then what are you obstructing? If you did nothing, how, how do you obstruct something that's not there? I find that uh, very confusing in that place. And one thing I would like to say, I'd listen to Mueller's report. I don't understand <clears throat> where it all changed. The president of American citizen, you're innocent until proven guilty. You're not guilty until you're proven innocent, but that really seems the political manner in which this is carried out. Yes, ma'am comment on the antitrust issue and the need for oversight into big tech companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google? Well, if you watched, in 2013, uh, the Federal Trade Commission actually looked at Google, Google and found that they did use um, anti-competitive um, actions, especially against TripAdvisor and Yelp. They also used their monopoly to utilize this. Now, where are they today? And, and they allowed Google to self-correct, even though staff asked that they would move further. 90% um, of all searches go through Google. That's a great deal of responsibility. In those searches, they'll give you a quarry of four choices as you're typing it in. If you put one negative version in there, that'll be the first one you go to. If you reach the first page, you're going to get all the eyes. If your article or whatever advertisement you have is on the second page, 90% of all people drop off. I think there is a concern that people are going to look at. I think it comes from a bipartisan basis. I personally have a concern about personal privacy, uh, personal privacy in all elements. When you look today, Facebook owns Instagram, Amazon, and you have Google owning YouTube. You have a lot of control over a few individuals. Are we allowing the market to, to work? Are we allowing new companies to rise up? Or are they allowing their monopoly behavior to control and not allow? In 2013, they were found guilty of that. So I think it's only right that people look at it. I don't see how breaking them up saves any privacy from myself. But I believe all individuals um, should know what's being taken from them, what data, and what data is being sold, and your ability to control that. Yes? Are you concerned that if these tariffs do take effect, it could interfere with the passage of the USMCA through Congress? I think the USMCA has met many milestones to actually get past now. You watched what happened in Canada uh, uh, last week. You watched what happened in Mexico. I think we have movement, uh, even from the 30-day mark of the administration sending down. I would like to see the situation on the border taken care of. I think that's different than USMCA. I think Mexico realizes that's different as well. The only thing that's holding up USMCA is the Speaker of the House. Speaker Nancy Pelosi can call it up and it will pass. And uh, it will only make America stronger. When we look to where America is today and our challenge with China, if you create an economy that's stronger, if you create more jobs, 
that only makes the debate for America in a stronger position to get a more level playing field with China. Getting the border taken care of, I mean, do you think the president's request for net zero? Um, I, I think the challenge we have, a lot of responsibility lies on Congress. There are actions with current within our law that if you look at Doug Collins, he has a bill out there closing a loophole. We have to deal with the Flores decision. We have to deal with asylum. It's harming those who truly need asylum. You've got 80% of all those cases, once they get to court years later, do not uphold. You've got people in unbelievable numbers that we haven't seen before just coming across on the magnet of having it. If asylum, you have fear of, fear for your life. Well, if you have fear for your life, but you go through two, three other countries before you come to America, why did you not claim asylum in the first country you went to? Why don't you claim asylum in the first country you go to, have the trial, have the trial go through, if you pass, if, if it uh, holds to be true, then you could come up. I think there is better ways to deal with it. They're common sense. They don't take a lot. It wouldn't be partisan on either level. It would actually help secure. And with... With the point that the president is trying to make, if Mexico is allowing to go forward, the president had a discussion with Mexico before, and in Mexico um, rose to the occasion and actually stopped individuals from coming. But think for one moment, the largest number that ever came in one encounter in one moment was about 400, and that was just a short time ago. But last week, 1,000 people in one encounter, in one location, in one moment in El Paso came across. Now we're hearing reports of people from other continents. It becomes a security issue. Yes, sir. Stuffing his constitutional authority on tariffs on Saudi arms sales. That's what the president has the authority to do it uh, from the same point. So I know there's checks and balances. Um, one thing that happens in these situations, which you find a Congress that will not act, you find a majority party that here we are in a Judiciary Committee, has not brought anything up for the border, has not had the hearing for the border that I see scheduled, but what do they have scheduled next week? They're bringing Dean in from Nixon era. This continues to go to a plan. The only thing the Democrats, when they wrote out their whole plan, the facts didn't lie where they hoped they would go. Adam Schiff had lied to the American public for two years. The Mueller report comes out and shows that he lied, and the Speaker continues to let him be the chairman of the Intel Committee. The committee that is allowed to see all the intelligence around the world to keep us safe, that individual lied to us for the last two years. They, writ they wrote a plan based upon those lies, and now they don't know what to do, and they're still trying to carry it out. Thank you very much.